I put my Christmas themed uh, first slide here to um, let you remember that we are mid-December and have nice holidays coming up. Um, these um, are just little illustrations of, of some of the things that we do in my lab. Um, and uh, I am professor in quantitative microscopy, but I don't have any microscopes in my lab. We briefly touched on networking before and um, working together with talented researchers from all over the place has been key in, in my whole uh, scientific career um, because it's my, my research is based on um, image data and um, but everything is algorithm development to try to extract scientific information from from the image data and um, today we'll talk focus about about this which is about um, spatial transcriptomics and in situ sequencing. And I will talk about that from a bit of an image analysis perspective. I'm trying to keep an eye on the chat, uh, but if you have uh, you know, urgent questions, just scream out and that will be um, more, more efficient uh, from, to, to get my attention. So uh, let me see if I can move forward here in my slides. Here we go. So uh, just to sort of position myself in the field, we have had lots of technological advancements when it comes to cell and tissue analysis over the years. And, you know, just uh, taking a sample and looking through the microscope is something that people have done for, for actually a few hundred years to uh, uh, understand disease. But just uh, looking at morphology, even if we have good stains, it has a lot of limitations um, because we can't really characterize the full cellular heterogeneity. We're always limited by what we can visualize. And um, sequencing has, of course, had a huge impact on the field, um, but also has its limitations because we only really get a bulk expression profile. And again, we don't really see the cellular heterogeneity. If we have, you know, small um, populations of really Really aggressive cells, they might just disappear in the noise. Uh, single cell sequencing is of course a, a really wonderful step forwards and we can understand what the different cell types are that we have in our samples. But it's also limited because we don't really know, again, the organization and the interaction between the different cell types. And this is where we want to have the whole fruit cake, see where everything is located in the tissue. And that is what we can do with in situ sequencing uh, techniques, uh, both the uh, in situ sequencing that I will talk about, but also techniques like spatial transcriptomics, um, which I will only touch upon uh, really briefly. And of course, this also has its limitations. We don't really see any, any of the wonderful dynamics that's happening in cells and so on. Uh, but that's a different story that I will not talk about today. So we'll focus on the in situ sequencing. And I will just go through this briefly. This is, uh, these illustrations come from our publication from 2013. Uh, when we first published, published this uh, method, where the, the molecular part was developed in Mats Nelson's lab in, in um, Silaf lab in Stockholm, and the computational part in my lab. Um, so when doing in situ sequencing, what you want to do is to find out what mRNAs you have in your tissue. So you first do a reverse transcription to cDNA, and then you use padlock probes. You can have two different versions, either a uh, barcoded padlock probe that is designed to exactly match the uh, cDNA that you're targeting, or you can have what's called the gap fill probe that has that is targeting parts of the sequence with a gap in between. And then if you have this uh, gap uh, probe, you can then fill this gap and you don't, and then you will pick up whatever single nucleotide polymorphisms, et cetera, that you would have within this gap. While with this barcoded um, probe, you will just get a circle by, by legating the two ends when they touch. And in both cases, uh, once you have this circle, you do ro rolling circle amplification. 
In the gap fill version, it's the, the gap that you would care about. You would want to know the, the sequence there. And in this targeted approach, it's actually this uh, designed barcode that you would like to um, decode. And once you have circular uh, RNA or DNA, um, you can then run the rolling circle amplification. And then you get many, many, many copies uh, of the same circle that is localized to the position where the RNA was originally then in the tissue. And when you, once you have this amplification, you do a uh, sequencing by ligation. So if we would zoom in on a small part of this blob of, of DNA, you would have then either that barcode or that uh, filled gap. And then you have an anchor primer, and then you have sequencing probes that are labeled with fluorescence. So in this case, the barcode starts with an A, so the T would bind. We get a green signal. This whole thing lights up, and this is what it would look like in the image. And to give you some sense of the resolution here, this small image would be part of, of, of this image where you start to see the cell nuclei, uh, and that would be part of a big tissue sample. And then you would continue. Uh, if the first letter in the code, uh, in the barcode was a C, you would have the G binding and a pink dot. So you sequence everything in parallel and you can then have many, many different uh, these probes um, targeting many different RNAs at the same time. And then once we have done the first letter in our first hybridization step, we would go for the second letter in the code and, and then have a um, second image. So here you see the same region in the, in the sample and um, the center signal here was pink in the first hybridization step and then um, light blue in the second hybridization step. And then we continue like this. And in the end, we have this series of images, uh, each one representing in one of the hybridization steps. And then we can uh, read off these letters. And if this is now a barcoded approach, we know that this combination of letters would represent one particular mRNA. And the good thing is here that if we have four letters um, in our um, four unique letters, then we can have four to the power of n unique barcodes. So if we have for sequencing rounds, we can have 256 different barcodes that we observe at the same time. And if we add one more hybridization round, we're up in, in um, 1024 multiplexing, which is quite powerful. And um, maybe in the background here, you see something bluish, that's the cell nuclei. So we are really at a cellular, cellular resolution uh, with, these, with these signals. And uh, there, so this is how it worked when we published it in 2013. Uh, now there are different variants of this, but they, they, they all have like the same basic um, concepts and with different pros and cons to them. But this is the basic concept. And um, so I work with image analysis and the challenge, the first challenge with this type of data is then to decode the data. Sometimes there is low signal to noise ratio, there is background fluorescence, the signals are dense, there is jitter or, or some movements of the signals between these different cycles, and sometimes the signals are quite dense. Um, depending a little bit on the design of the protocol, you can have a reference uh, channel that shows all the uh, rolling circle products. Uh, or you might only have the um, output from different um, Russian channels and then the sequencing rounds in this dimension. And then what you want to do is to find each of these little signals and then figure out uh, which letter do we have in this particular possession, position in each of the sequencing cycles. And my first... Um, implementation of this was, was quite naive and it was just um, finding uh, all the blob-like blob, blob -like structures in, in this part of, of the data and then going into the other channels and reading uh, the intensity there after some, some um, pre-processing. And it, it worked sufficiently well to, uh, to be a powerful method 
But after that, we have continued to try to improve this, especially to compensate for the slight, slight jitter, slight um, movement of these individual dots in, in the tissue. And <clears throat> just briefly going to mention two other approaches that we're using today to analyze this. One is based on a um, uh, graph approach where we kind of think of as, as going through these different cycles as, as a flow uh, from a source to a sink. So if we have a, a cluster of signals, we want to find then the, the path between the different cycles that has a, uh, a um, um, strong similarity with the morphology of these dots, sorry, uh, across the cycles and also um, a short distance between them so that we find an optimal path through the cycles so that we can decode um, the sequences and decide what gene is in each position. A, a different approach that we are actually just now submitting for publication is based on uh, matrix factorization where you think of this as a, as a volume where, the, where you have the X and Y and then the rounds and channels in, in the next dimension. And then um, we think of these signals as point spread functions. And then in each position here, the yellow cross represents one position in one of these uh, channel round dimensions. In that particular position, we have then a combination of intensities and then we also have the, the a priori known uh, barcodes that we're searching for. And then we can use a type of a deconvolution approach to deconvolve this set of sequencing rounds and channels and then get out um, an image for each of these um, genes that we're looking for so that we get a representation of each gene in a separate image. And that turns out to be quite powerful actually. So this is uh, a um, image of the um, uh, of a mouse brain, just to give you a bit of a feeling for the dimensions. So this is a interface that we developed to visualize the data that comes out from the in situ sequencing, and it's based on a similar type of uh, backend as um, Google Earth. So when you zoom in, uh, you get more information. Uh, just like you get the street names uh, and, and more detailed information about the map when you zoom into, in, into Google Maps. And here I'm only showing a few different genes um, and then I can um, change the colors and the uh, size and shape of the symbols here so that I can go in uh, and see more detail. And here you can see if we, now I changed the size of the symbols to see more um, expression at the uh, single cell level. So in the background here, you see the, the um, cell nuclei again, and, and how here we can then display hundreds of different um, genes at the same time. This is a free and open source tool, and we have several published data sets that you can go in and explore in this uh, tissue maps to research.it.uu.se uh, to, to play with the data. Uh, Here's another example. I would have loved to show this live, uh, but it's a bit scary when running Zoom and running this at the same time because it can be a bit slow. Uh, we're working now on making it super fast. So next time I talk, I will be doing a live presentation. But I wanted to show you this. Uh, this is um, a uh, zoom in of a part of a heart and uh, or an embryonic heart. And when you look here, you can see that it's um, not really random distributions of the gene expression. You might be able to see that there's a bit more of the turquoise here towards the edge and more, more yellowish orange um, genes expressed more towards the center. Um, and then if I zoom out now uh, to this in, in, in this whole data set, that little uh, zoom in was represented by this little square here. And here you see then um, slices from three different hearts at three different developmental stages. And again, you, you kind of see that there's some patterns that do not seem to be random, but there might be some structure to it. And 
of course this is this is useful but it's kind of difficult to comprehend and what people want to do with the data is often to understand what are the different cell types in different parts of the tissue and um, one approach uh, which was published um, earlier this year uh, by, by Mats Nilsson's group was to find all the cell nuclei in the tissue and then assign signals close to a given nuclei, nucleus to that um, um, nucleus and then compare that gene expression profile with data from in situ sequence or from single cell sequencing and it's it's a powerful method but it has a few drawbacks and one is that it relies on the fact that you can really segment out the cell nuclei and cell nucle nucleus segmentation is tricky my phd thesis was about that so i know and many of the methods are, are good, but it's always limitations. And also sometimes the nuclei are not really in the particular section that you're at, and then they can be clumped and so on and so forth. So, so that is the limitation of this approach. And also you would need to have a single cell sequencing data to relate your output to. And also uh, in, when you do single cell sequencing, you might have RNAs that are far away from the nuclei that are lost. In, in the process. And there might be really interesting information happening there. And um, it's something that you want to make use of when you do the sequencing in the directly in the tissue. So we were thinking about this. And then one of my uh, PhD students uh, was talking about uh, social networks and functional regions. So what do we mean by this? So uh, every mRNA in some sense codes for a function. So imagine that it codes for the function scissors. And scissors can um, be present in many different types of uh, activities or environments. But then if the scissors appear together with a comb, you can know that you're in the functional domain hairdresser. But if it is together with a, a glove, you might be you know, in the surgical unit and then together with colorful papers, you might be in a kindergarten. So it's the combination or the, the network of functions that really defines the functional region. Uh, of course, you can have hairdressers that use gloves. Uh, so, so in reality, you would have like a manifold of these functions. And you can be at different dimensions. You could have, you know, larger functional units like a beauty saloon or a hospital or a school that would have even a larger network of this type of, of um, functional domains. So what we decided to do then was to look at these uh, gene expression maps and then use a graph approach. So we connect genes that are expressed close to one another and then we use a uh, graph neural network to search for uh, kind of search for reoccurring patterns so we, we don't have any training data other than the randomized uh, gene expression so we care we compare what we have, what we find in the tissue to a randomization of what we find in the tissue so that would be the the positive and negative samples during the training of this graph neural network and um, the output would be this feature space or this, this manifold. And we can then either describe the manifold um, or reduce it to, to 3D and, and visualize it in color space, or we can do some clustering in this multidimensional space to find um, these reoccurring local combinations of functions. And the, the really fun thing was this, is that these functional units that we detect in the tissue samples, they correlate very well with the single cells <clears throat> in the tissue as um, found by these methods that are dependent on the cell segmentation. And um, we have compared this to a number of different data sets. And we see then that our, what we call spage to vec clusters that are based on no a priori information at all 
um, just comparing the gene expression that we see in the tissue to randomization. Uh, it corresponds quite well with the cell types detected by other approaches. What is interesting to see is that sometimes the spatial direct clusters can uh, get uh, a subdivision also of some of the um, cell types found by the uh, uh, methods that combine um, spatial transactomics with single cell sequencing. And of course, we have then also the power to find things that are not found by the single cell sequencing. Another thing that we have been um, playing with with this output data is to divide the whole um, image into little patches. And then we treat each patch or the gene expression within, maybe it's too small to see here, but you can imagine that this is some, some kind of pixelation of this mouse brain here. And uh, each of these little pixels represents then one patch. And then we think of that patch as a vector including the gene expression within that, that particular region. And then we take all those vectors and drew them into um, a UMAP. Um, and then we uh, reduce that to three dimensions and describe it as a color space. And just doing, just doing that on this mouse brain, we get this really colorful and, and symmetric pattern here. Uh, and what, what we see here is gradients in variation in gene expression. In parts of the brain, we have sharp edges, sharp transitions between uh, variations in gene expression. In other, in other places, it's more, more nice um, gradual variations in the gene expression. And based on these patterns, what we can do is also um, clustering. And then it turns out that these clusters that we get are highly reproducible across uh, different samples. And also many of the clusters that we discover coincide very well with these uh, different atlases that are available. The nice thing of, of finding the regions with this approach is that it automatically compensates for slight variations in, in how the sample was uh, cut and, and so on and so forth. And we have seen that if you, if you have it, some uh, sort of housekeeping markers, you could use as few as only 18 markers to uh, do this region segmentation of the brain. And then you might have the possibility then to use the, the other markers as exploration genes and then you would automatically be able to assign them to, to a particular compartment. And this is um, of course true also for other types of, of organs and so forth. And so when I showed my overview of, of the advances in, in what we can do with tissue, I also mentioned um, that we can look at the morphology of the tissue. And I know the next talk will be about uh, deep learning and, and AI, so I'm not going to go into the details there. But I just wanted to share some really exciting stuff that, or stuff that I find really exciting that we're doing now. So earlier we um, approached uh, grading of prostate cancer with deep learning. And we had access then to a large data set where we had manual annotations or pen marks on these prostate biopsies, marking where in the uh, in these biopsies there was uh, tumor and, and, and not and, and healthy tissue. And uh, what we could do then uh, was to like, digitally transfer these uh, pen marks to the tissue sample and extract benign and malignant samples and then train a deep convolutional neural network to find or to learn to uh, differentiate between normal and malignant tissue and then also for the malignant part of the tissue to actually extract the Gleason pattern. And we published this earlier this, uh, yeah, in, in January this year um, in Lancet Oncology and we had really high accuracy in the um, detection of these patterns. And, and starting from that, uh, learn that network model that we had trained, uh, we can then um, apply it to new data sets. 
and either then do the automated grading, but also just use it as a feature extractor to have a, an automated way of describing the local tissue. So what we're doing now is to combining all of this. So this is a, uh, a slice of a prostate tumor with manual annotations of where we have different grades of tumor. And then with this neural network, we can uh, automatically find regions that have different morphologies. Uh, in this case, you see that some of the patterns like the, the green here corresponds to, to the yellow here and the light yellow here corresponds to the dark red here. But then we have more regions here, more regions that were than what was found by the manual annotations. And then we can use these spatially resolved gene expression methods. In this case, it's actually spatial transcriptomics and not in situ sequencing. Um, um, but, but again, uh, the factors here or the differences in gene expression here uh, seem to both correlate with the manual annotations, but then also with the more refined uh, division of clusters that we have with our automated classification seem to have good correlations here. So this is something that we're really super excited about, that maybe the computer can find more morphological variations than uh, can do with a visual assessment, and then also correlate those with the variations in gene expression. And, um, you know, we're trying more and more to combine this also with other spatially resolved methods and imaging techniques. So in the end, it's sort of like a, a, a smorgasbord, uh, many different uh, types of information and tastes and textures that are combined. And um, adding a bit of uh, computations and, and AI to this whole thing, we have the black box, we have uh, very high dimensions and maybe some things that are not so easy to understand. But even if we start with a bit of a black box, I think that we have the power, power to um, understand and, and discover new things. So it's really a, a gift box that we are um, looking into and having lots of fun stuff to move as we move, do as we move forward. And just as my very last slides, I want to mention that if you want to try in situ sequencing, there is a new uh, facility within SciLife Lab uh, run by Shika Yokota. Um, and uh, they take lots of different types of samples as input um, up to slide, glass slide size, and they provide us output then images and CSV files with um, IDs and coordinates. And this is where we as the bioimage informatics facility to come in, can come in and, and support you because we can take these either the raw data and run our latest uh, decoding approaches to it, but also uh, work with the CSV files. Uh, we can give you access to this data exploration tools uh, to, to view the data, but then also have um, apply these uh, spage to vec and, and other clustering methods um, and, and help you explore the output data.